All right. So how does this actually work? So we have this thing that we call flow cell. Flow cell has eight lanes. It's actually basically pretty much the uh, size of a laboratory slide that you put under a microscope. Um, and then within these are sort of sections within each lane. And what there's a substrate that's been laid down here that has a bunch of adapters. And what will happen is that these adapters will bind to DNA and cause these areas of fluorescence to happen. Uh, show that a little bit sort of better way. So you can imagine here that along each one of these flow cells, there is an adapter substrate that's been bound. And the goal is to have your fragments of DNA attached to these. And since this is a, um, I should mention that all of these three sort of technologies are basically what are called sort of sequencing by synthesis, which is you allow uh, DNA polymerase to replicate the strand as it naturally would in the body, except there are fluorophores in the case of the Illumina technology attached to these. And each time you replicate the thing, the fluorophores are released in one of the four different sort of spectra. However, technology like Illumina here, a single fluorophore being sequenced like this um, is not enough to be detected. So the way this actually works is that you see here, this sort of right here, these gray fragments represent fragments of DNA that you've prepared for sequencing. They get ligated with special adapters. These adapters are complementary to areas here. So the little ones that are sort of um, sort of free-floating here, imagine this sort of a isometric view of part of the lane. They attach here. And before you do your actual sequencing, you go through several steps of replicating each one of these pieces of DNA. So DNA comes through, it gets attached. It gets replicated once, so there's two. It gets replicated again, there's four. Eventually, you build up. So there's things called we call clusters. And once the clusters reach a certain size, the the effect of of the synthesis and the full forward getting it detached will actually create a signal that is strong enough. And this is basically sort of done in what are called cycles. So one at a time, you flow through uh, the the length of the flow cell, just a a, a solution of the, of of nucleotides that have the flow fours attached, and it's sort of a uh, sort of time sort of thing where you go through, it happens, you get enough of a signal from each one of the clusters, and that's sort of how you get um, one of these pictures that you see right here. This is a picture in just one of the four wavelengths that it would be. So this, this picture either represents A, T, C, or G. Um, and then it takes a picture in each of the four, and then it slowly goes through each time in a cycle to replicate one thing see the fluorescence. Um, I think I've basically covered that in these things. Uh, the one thing to note that is you don't want to overcluster. So, so you can imagine if here this is pretty good. But if you haven't, if your titration of the amount of DNA that you've flowed down the cell is too high, you can imagine these clusters get too close together and you won't, the machine's optics will not be able to resolve one cluster from another. Um, another issue, too, is a question of diversity. So generally, if you're sequencing something that's the size of a genome or transcriptome, it's not really a problem. But you can imagine if the sample that you are sequencing is like an amplicon, where you just PCR'd up a few distinct parts of the genome, they're going to be very similar to each other. And so the chances of two clusters being next to each other that happen to be, or a number of clusters that are next to each other that happen to be the same base pair during the same cycle increases with the the chance increases the less diversity you have of sequence types in your thing. So if there's too many of these together, it'll start getting ambiguous and the machine will not be able to resolve. Um, so it's sort of a trade-off between getting a lot of clusters, because the more clusters you have, the more sequencing you get done, but the more clusters uh, the more chance you have of ambiguity and not being able to properly resolve one of the clusters, uh, which base pair is being generated by which cluster. Um, this is another sort of schematic view of this. You can see here in the first part, 
where the DNA is getting the adapters bound to it. Uh, the adapters come through, they bind to uh, the adapters that have been put in the substrate. Um, they do the step which is called the bridging step, which is how they sort of replicate out into double strands and then single strands again. And then here, I think, in your view of it, I think it kind of shows the clusters a little bit better than that previous diagram. Okay. So that's sort of the basic idea behind how the Illumina sequencing works. Um, generally, in the early days, you would just put one sample per lane. Um, but what you can do now is in these um, adapter sequences you have, they all have now a sort of unique six to eight base pair uh, segment, which there are 24 different variants of them. All of them vary by at least two base pairs. And you can basically think of these as barcodes. So what you can do is by taking multiple different samples and distinctively attaching certain of these adapters only to some of them and some of the adapters to others of them, you can actually just sequence them all in the same lane. And then afterwards, once I get the data, as part of the sort of initial process in the step, we basically just go through and those barcodes were sequenced during a very specific sequence of the, of the, of the cycling that I was telling you earlier. And so we always know where those are and we can always just sort of go through and basically sort them out, right? We look at them, see them, and decide what pile they go. Uh, this sort of makes the, uh, the fact that Illumina is, like I said, the sort of best bulk sequencer um, a little bit more uh, fine-tuned in that maybe you don't need that many reads, but you still want the sort of cost-effectiveness of it. So you can put two, four, up to, in the basic um, uh, system, 24 of these different uh, adapters and then you'll basically say, well, you know, if I don't need um, in the one lane 100 million reads, I only need maybe 25 million reads, well, you can put four samples in there, separate them out later. Um, one of the things we've been noticing uh, recently, at least in a few things, is that as Illumina's sort of chemistry and their uh, optics have gotten better, it's actually turned out that their ability to resolve the, the clusters are better in the sort of uh, general pool of DNA than in the, the um, in these adapters because you can imagine like you have a very diverse pool of DNA in whatever sample you're running so you don't really have to worry so much about clusters next to each other too often being the same uh, nucleotide but if you're only multiplexing two samples well during that part of the read you're basically dealing with one of two possible base pairs right and sometimes these adapters will share the same base pair at a particular point in that 68 base pair thing. Uh, so for that reason, I have tended to recommend to people now to always at least do, if you're going to multiplex, you should always multiplex at least four samples at a time. If that's less uh, reads than you want, uh, you can always just have two lanes done, for example, right? So some of these problems we were having with some people, they were, they were only multiplexing two samples in one lane two samples in another lane. The data, the actual reads themselves look great. Um, however, I could not resolve them into their two appropriate pools because the machine was really confused during the, the indexing step. Uh, so you can imagine, you'd still be doing two lanes, you'd just be doing four in each lane. And you basically get the same effect, but you still at least got uh, enough diversity to make sure your barcodes go through. Um, one thing to note, and this may seem obvious, but sometimes people don't get it. Uh, when you're multiplexing, you're not actually increasing the number of leads you're getting from a lane. Um, if you do four uh, samples in a multiplex, you're getting effectively one-fourth the read. Um, in fact, you're not necessarily going to get an even 25, 25, 25 percent division. Um, sometimes titration doesn't always work as well. Sometimes some of the samples are a little bit more biased than others. So, you know, one might be like, you know, sometimes it can be really bad. One sample will be like 50% of the reads, and then the other three samples will be sort of, um, and these, these effects can multiply a lot more. Like, if you're going up to, we don't have many people trying to do more than four or eight, but if you're trying to go up to like 24, you know, don't necessarily expect that 
each of your reads is going to get 4%. The titration effects are going to sort of amplify, right? You're going to have some that are down like at 1%. You're going to have one guy who's at like 9%. And you're not necessarily going to get it um, as even a distribution as you expect. Um, however, if you're not intimidated by that, you can get even more multiplexing by doing what's now called sort of 2D barcodes or double